Hello everyone, welcome fellow Googlers and guests. I am delighted to introduce to you today an extremely inspiring, thoughtful, and genuine person, the chairman and CEO of the Container Store and the author of Uncontainable, Kip Tyndall. Kip has been the helm of the Container Store since its doors opened in Dallas in 1978. This is the first store that was devoted solely to the organizational and storage products. The Container Store has stores nationwide now um, and a thriving website. But, Kip, for, but for Kip, the goal has never been growth for growth sakes, but rather to adhere to the company's value-based foundation, foundation principles, which center around an employee-first culture, superior customer service, and strict merchandising. In November 2013, under Kip's leadership, the Container Store became a public company. The primary reasons, again, for this being to get more stock into the hands of employees, to maximize the autonomy for the company's culture and management team, and to have a more visible stage to create a conscious company that inspires others to emulate. Kip is also very actively involved in the community, dedicating time and resources to the Salesmanship Club of Dallas, serving on the board of, the, of Whole Foods Market. He is also the first vice president, vice chairman of the board, chairman of finance committee, and treasurer of the National Retail Federation. And last, but certainly not least, he is passionately involved as a leader in Conscious Capitalism, Inc., uh, which is a community of like-minded business, thought and academic leaders who are working to elevate humanity uh, through a conscious approach to business. Um, and before Kip begins telling us about his book, um, we have a short video to watch. How do you build a business where everyone can thrive? by simultaneously creating value for everyone involved. For us, that starts with our employees. Everything that I do and don't do matters and affects someone around me. And when you feel that kind of responsibility, going to work is exciting. I can't wait to get up and get my day started. That's what I love about working at the Container Store. I don't just sell products, I solve problems by helping our customers get organized, which I know can improve their lives. I can really focus on helping them because I get the communication, training, and support I need from the company, my managers, and team. I absolutely love walking into the store. No matter what my day's been like, I can always find a little bit of calm to take home. The employees are so happy and helpful, you can't help but smile. And let me tell you, my kids notice when I'm less stressed. When I can find what I'm looking for, I have more energy, and I can get everyone out the door on time. The Container Store is more like a friend than a company. I'm not just a vendor to them. We're partners in success. They looked beyond the fact that I was just starting my business and they saw the potential in my product and in me. Because of our partnership, my business has grown tremendously. We've hired more people, developed new products, and even taken on a new factory. Together, we've impacted so many lives. Our unique partnership over the years has impacted the way thousands of people think about their minds, increasing creativity, organizing their minds, and increasing their capacity to think smarter. Our connection with the Container Store has helped us support many conscious businesses. Their commitment to their foundation principles, employee-first culture, and conscious capitalism is not just marketing spin, it's making a difference. The idea that you can make business decisions based on love and still be highly profitable is gaining momentum and credibility. And profits aren't a bad thing. They're what give businesses the ability to take better care of their employees and give more to their communities. It's not altruism, it's capitalism, being done in a conscious way that ensures everyone. All the customers. The employees. All the vendors. The entire community. And the shareholders. Can, Can all thrive together. Now if you can all help me in extending a warm welcome to Kip Tyndall. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that's what we're trying to do at the Container Store, is uh, create a business where everyone thrives. And um, we spend more time working than any other waking endeavor. And so 
I just think it's probably the best thing you can do with all those hours that you spend working, create a business where everyone thrives. And that means very much in the conscious capitalist uh, stakeholder model, the employee thrives, the community thrives, the vendor thrives, uh, the shareholder thrives, the, uh, everyone associated with the business uh, thrives. How many of you have shopped at the container store? So, okay, that's pretty good. We have to work on you too. <laughs> um, well, it's, um, we began in 1978 with one tiny little uh, 1,600 square foot store in Dallas, Texas with a whopping $35,000 in, uh, in capital. And somehow we knew, I don't know how, but somehow we knew that, um, I mean, people think of the container store as saving space, getting you organized. But what I think we're really doing is giving our customers the gift of organization. You really have no choice but to be reasonably well organized in your life if you're going to accomplish half of what you want to accomplish. Something as simple as getting two children ready for school in the morning is either a nightmare or a pleasure depending upon how organized you are and they are. Um, traveling is so much simpler if you're reasonably well organized. So I really do feel like we're giving the gift of, or, of an organized life to, uh, to our customers. Um, it was interesting starting the business. I mean, my dad, who's like, he's kind of like a Texas oil man, right? He was like, you're gonna open a store that sells empty boxes? I mean, he was really concerned about all that, but my dad's not really the target customer at all, so it all, all worked out. <clears throat> we run our company on seven foundation principles, which I won't be able to go into all in this little talk, but they're all, um, uh, available online at our blog, uh, whatwestandfor.com, whatwestandfor.com. And these seven foundation principles are identical to the four tenets of conscious capitalism. And we've been operating that way since 1978. We just didn't know to call it conscious capitalism back then. And so they're simple, almost carny, do unto others type um, uh, things that everybody agrees on. I mean. How many of you don't really agree with that do unto others thing? You think that's kind of a bad idea? So see, everybody agrees with these simple things. Um, one of them is Andrew Carnegie's statement. Uh, the great industrialist Andrew Carnegie was laying on his deathbed and attributed all of his business success to the one credo, the one guiding light that uh, uh, fill the other guy's basket to the brim, M making money then becomes an easy proposition. Fill the other guy's basket to the brim Making money then becomes an easy proposition. That's the exact opposite of what people are raised to believe, that business is somehow a zero-sum game where someone has to lose in order for you to win. And um, so that, that, that one foundation principle, fill the other guy's basket, has us creatively crafting mutually beneficial relationships with our vendors and, and uh, uh, being able to compete with the giant mass merchant retailers in America because we can't beat them on volume necessarily, but we can beat them on relationship, synergistic, win-win, uh, fill the other guy's basket relationship with these vendors. And you become your, your vendor's favorite customer. And uh, you don't have to beat up your vendor to get ahead. It's, it's far better to creatively craft that mutually beneficial relationship, which is only limited by your imagination and how much you can learn about each other's businesses. And then you form this synergistic relationship that is immensely more profitable than just the old power struggle, the tug and you know, uh, back and forth of trying to, to, to sort of beat up the vendor. And it's much more uh, enjoyable. If you, look at the, if you look at the companies that are dominating their niches, and, and Google's a great example, Southwest Airlines, uh, Whole Foods, uh, Costco, um, they're very good at those synergistic relationships. That's where actually more money is made. Conscious capitalism is not a sacrifice. Conscious capitalism actually makes you more profitable than if you were trying to do it the other way. And that's why I think that eventually people like John Mackey, the, the Whole Foods guy, and I can quit trying to spread the word uh, about conscious capitalism, because I think a good capitalist is going to eventually adopt that methodology which is most successful, right? And, uh, and it's, it's kind of a movement, and it's kind of beginning to happen like that. Skepticism is vanishing, much to my delight and surprise. When we did our, our IPO roadshow, um, the largest institutional 
investors on Wall Street, all they really wanted to talk about was conscious capitalism and the, and the quirky, yummy culture of the container store. I thought when I tried to talk about culture, they would roll their eyes and get impatient and think kumbaya and all that. But I mean, skepticism is vanishing on this. And it's, it's fun to give a, a presentation at Google because Google is a great, a great example of it. So I encourage you to read about the foundation principles. They're, they're simple. Uh, you can read about them on the blog, what we stand for. And they were created as a, as a means to the end. Um, we have 6,000 employees. Uh, we don't want to be 6,000 yahoos going in 6,000 different directions. So we agree on the ends, like fill the other guy's basket to the brim, and then everybody's enabled to choose their own means to the end. You know, I don't think I'm smart enough. No one's smart enough to tell that many people how to handle any given situation because life's too situational. And, Certainly retail is too situational. So that unharnesses everybody to use their own individual creative genius to figure out how to get to that end. And, and you'll hear things like, well, why do we do it that way? Well, you know, that's because of the, uh, that's because of the Andrew Carnegie thing, the fill the other guy's basket to the, I mean, that pretty, and, and what's remarkable about that, and it kind of surprised me how true it is, even though you never told all these people how to handle a particular circumstance, just liberating everybody to agree on these ends and choose their own means causes a circumstance that arises in the Miami store to be handled miraculously uh, the same as it, as it is in the Seattle store. You know, I mean, um, people are people, they're using individual means, but the ends are, are, are the same. Does that make sense? I mean, it's just the whole means to the end thing. I think it's oppressive to try to tell people how to get to the end. Let them figure out, let them be themselves. Let them be their own beautiful, unique personalities, and then just kind of agree on the, on, on the ends. Um, conscious capitalism is something I'm passionate about. Um, weirdly and oddly enough, John Mackey, the quirky, wonderful uh, uh, founder and CEO of Whole Foods, and I were actually college roommates at University of Texas, and it's just bizarre. And then we both went off and started these conscious capitalist retail businesses. Um, we kind of, well, we saw each other a little bit, but not that much after school. We were so busy uh, being entrepreneurs and growing our businesses. And after about 20 years, we got together for this um, uh, really extensive, almost all day long Time Magazine article. And we were rolling on the floor laughing hysterically at how identical our business philosophies had become, even though we hadn't, I mean, that's not what we talked about in college. You know what we talked about in college, and it wasn't, it wasn't conscious capitalism. You know, it was girls. Or it was, you know, it wasn't retail. And um, so many identical things that we thought no one believed or no one thought, and it was just hysterical. And that article is still out there on the internet, Time Magazine with John Mackey and Kip Tyndall. The four tenets of conscious capitalism, number one, you have a higher purpose as a business. Uh, you have a higher purpose than just profit or just making money for your business. I don't know any entrepreneurs. I don't think I've ever met an entrepreneur that said the reason they did what they did was to make a lot of money. You know, doctors don't say the reason I became a doctor is to make a lot of money, right? I mean, it, it's, uh, you have a higher purpose besides just, uh, just profits. That's one of the four tenets of conscious capitalism. The other is conscious leadership. Um, Conscious leadership, I, I think CEOs get too much credit. They're kind of, in this um, celebrity culture, I think they're a little over-glamorized. It's really the people behind them, people around them, the management team and the, um, the part-time worker in the store that, uh, that really makes the business uh, what it is. But with conscious capitalism, that, that person who is in that top role in the, in the top management team needs to really genuinely believe in their heart and soul in conscious capitalism, or it cannot and will not happen in that organization because there's too many forces to push against it. It has to be okay to behave like that thoroughly. And it really helps for that um, individual uh, leader to uh, kind of understand and embody the whole servant leadership aspect of, of leadership and not be particularly in it for themselves. Uh, what really helps is if they're kind of pretty high on Maslow's hierarchy of need. You know, it's, it's hard to manage that way if you're cold or hungry or lonely or still trying to prove to your dead father that you're a great businessman. 
You know, I mean, those th you know, deep-seated insecurities get in the way of that type of leadership. Servant leadership is a, a key component of conscious capitalism, and I think it sums it up very well. Uh, and one thing I've learned is I used to just think we needed the smartest person to take that uh, big, important job. And, and I love intelligence, and you look for that, but the, the social IQ is even more important than the intellectual IQ. It's something I've really learned. And uh, So having those qualities, those... Uh, uh, understanding and being good at nurturing and communication, social IQ, being calmly uh, self-confident but in a very servant leadership giving way so that you're not, you can't give if you're that needy. You know, you can't be a good leader and you can't do much for the world around you if you uh, don't have anything to give. So that type of conscious leadership is the second uh, point that I think is so important in conscious leadership. The other is a stakeholder model, and I love the stakeholder model. And um, Ed Freeman at University of Virginia, Darden School of Business, is credited with having created the uh, conscious capitalism stakeholder model. Um, you're, you're optimizing the needs of all of the stakeholders of the business. Um, let's see. Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman, the famous um, economist, once said, the only reason a corporation exists is to maximize the return of the shareholder. And we're like, you know what, Milton, I know you won a Nobel Prize and everything. With all due respect, at the container store, we actually put the employee first. And if you take better care, I mean, if you really take better care of the employee than anybody else, she's got to really take care of the customer than anybody else. And if those two people are ecstatic, and let's face it, if your employees are ecstatic, you're getting remarkable productivity. If your customers are ecstatic, you're getting remarkable sales. If those two people are ecstatic, your shareholder is going to be ecstatic too. So I'm not sure we really refute or disagree with uh, uh, Milton Friedman on the end. We just have a different means to the end. And um, it's more joyful to do it that way. And if you myopically focus only on the shareholder, the magic is lost and very often uh, the employees are unhappy and the customers are unhappy and the shareholder is going to be unhappy too. So the stakeholder model allows us to put the employee first and to never rest while we try to see how much more we can do for that employee. And I, I can't wait for my tour of Google headquarters here in a minute. I can see so much of that here. It's, it's a joy to see. It, it really, I mean, of course I love it. I, it's, it's so great. And uh, like, like Google, the container store has been on the um, Fortune 100 Best Companies to Work for in America list for, uh, in our case, 15 uh, straight years. Uh, we were number one twice, number two twice. Uh, I think Google was number one at least once. It's a never-ending game. You know, you're constantly trying to uh, see what else you can do for the employee. Um, as a result, after 36 years, I think our employee morale is the highest it's ever been right now. Um, uh, one of the reasons we went public was to get more stock in the hands of employees. It's, it's standard operating procedure to do options when you're public. When you're private, you have to depend upon your private partners believing enough in getting stock in the hands of employees to dilute themselves. Um, I've always believed in doing that. My wife, Sharon, is our chief merchant, and we were lucky enough to you know, get a bunch of stock in 1978 in this company that turned out to be kind of a fairy tale success story, and so we can dilute ourselves in order to get people like these two wonderful vice presidents here uh, more stock. And I think the, the happiest, most devoted employee in the world still does better if they own you know, some, some of the company. But if you're private, you have to, see people don't understand that it's better to own 50% of a dollar than 100% of a nickel. And your beautiful private investors um, usually have some lawyer or spouse or accountant that really won't let them do that. So that's a, one of the major reasons we, we, went, we went public. Also in that stakeholder model, you have the vendor stakeholder. You can't tell the difference between a, a vendor and a employee at the container store. I love elevating the relationships that we have with these manufacturers. We really are, somebody gets the lowest price in the country. So, somebody gets the last pallet of a, very hot item uh, that holiday season. Um, we create products with these vendors. This guy's the best at wire. This guy's the best at wood. Okay, let's create the wood in Estonia where all the wood, wood is. 
And the same people for five, 15, 25 years, you're, 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 you're creating product that nobody else carries. It's exclusive to the container store. And these relationships build and they become best fr your best friend. You, you travel the world with them and you create product that is so fun. I mean, uh, we get excited about silly things. We get excited about having, we just recently created the, the world's absolutely best shoe boxes and sweater boxes. I mean, it was ecstasy to us, you know, I mean, it was just fun. And, um, but you pick these people that are the most talented manufacturing certain types of products. And then since the container store has its finger closer to the pulse of the consumer than most manufacturers, you can create great product that the big mass merchants don't have. You have no reason to exist if you're selling the same thing everybody else is. And that's, that's creatively crafting a mutually beneficial relationship with the, with the vendor. And then when you do well, when you have very high financial performance, you can do wonderful things for the community. Uh, communities go out of their way to do anything they can with the container store. This one wants our headquarters and it's town because they really see us as embodying family values and they do that so they uh, make it impossible for us to not locate in that in that community it's so nice when the communities that you serve open with open arms um, help you and in, in, in fact conscious capitalism what it really does is it causes the universe to conspire to assist you and it's a lot easier to be successful in business when the universe is conspiring to assist you than it is if people are laying awake at night trying to figure out how to get back at you. you know. And it makes life so pleasant to be loved rather than hated. You know? I mean, it, it, uh, I think the universe conspires to assist an individual or a company when it behaves this way. Um, the fourth tenet of conscious capitalism is the conscious culture. The culture drives the value of the business. I believe the culture drives the value of Google. It certainly drives the value of the container store. Much to my happiness, I discovered that most of the uh, institutional investors on Wall Street accept the notion that the culture drives the value of the business. Um, Drucker said that you know culture eats strategy for breakfast in the morning, and it's really true. Um, and so those are the four tenets of conscious capitalism, and they happen to be exactly the same thing as our seven foundation principles, which you're going to go on to um, whatwestandfor.com to learn more about, I hope. I hope. So capitalism has a public relations problem. Um, it really does. I mean, people think, I mean, I'm a capitalist. Uh, if you ask... Uh, a bunch of millennial people, or even a bunch of baby boomers, whether they want to be a capitalist, they'll, most of them will say no. If you ask them if they want to be an entrepreneur, they'll all say yes. But I mean, they don't want to be a capitalist. And, um, but capitalism is actually good. Uh, I'm kind of a, when I talk about this, it makes me sound like some kind of a libertarian or something. Uh, Mackey is, but I'm not. I'm kind of a moderate Democrat. But, uh, Capitalism is the most efficient system ever devised to move goods and services and get them where they needed to be to the betterment of, of, of humanity. You know, communism didn't work. 200 million people died, right? Uh, socialism isn't working that well. 200 years ago, uh, a little more than 85% of the world's population lived on a dollar a day. 200 years ago, including in this country. Most people lived on a dollar a day. Now, only 16% of the world lives on a dollar a day. That type of abject poverty is certainly moving in a good trend. And um, by the time the age group in this room, by the time you're at the end of the lifespan of your children, that number is thought to be, will be like one one hundredth of one percent. It's really thought will be that, um, you know, that, that negligible. Uh, Bill, uh, uh, Bill Clinton is running around the world giving a speech that's roughly entitled uh, charity won't save the world, business will. Business is so much more powerful than all the nonprofits and charities of the world that if we can harness the good of business to um, make the world and the planet better than it's been, uh, not only will those businesses do better, but the world will be you know, quite a bit better off as well. So that's really the power of conscious capitalism. And if you look at John Mackey and Raj Sisodia, co-wrote the book Conscious Capitalism. Great book. You should read Conscious Capitalism. If you haven't, I bet some of you have. Um, 
Raj is on our board at the Container Store, uh, uh, college professor, big rock star, international uh, uh, college professor. He did an exhaustive study that is so helpful to have of all the companies, the public companies in America that have, uh, including Google, uh, that have been public for a, a good long while. And what he discovered is that those companies outperformed the S&P index 14 to 1 over the last 15 years. I mean, 14 to 1, are you kidding me? That's 1,400, it's not 20% better or 80% better, it's 1,400% better and for a long time, uh, uh, 15 years. And those companies like Google and Whole Foods and Southwest Airlines, the container store is not on the list yet. He's, it's in the book, he studied us too, but we, didn't, we haven't been public for, for long enough to be on that part of it. We've been public for just under a year. Um, so if all you really want to do is make as much money as humanly possible, as rapidly as possible, I would submit to you that conscious capitalism is the way to do it. But further than that, it enriches your lives and the lives of the people you do business with uh, hugely while it's doing that. No wonder the universe conspires to help companies like that. You know, everybody's proud of the way they behave themselves. Everybody's proud of the fact that they help their communities. If a company nurtures its employees, certainly seems to be going on here, makes them feel valued, uh, elevates their self-esteem rather than tearing down their self-esteem, uh, pays them well, lets them be themselves at work, rewards the creativity that comes from them being themselves, uh, spends money to train and develop them, makes them thrive. That employee goes home at night and he treats his family differently, better. Treats his golden retriever better. Uh, Treats the guy at the 7-Eleven on the way home totally differently, you know. He's way up on Maslow. He's, he's, he's a fulfilled, uh, generous, but self-confident human being that behaves differently. And when companies do that, when organizations do that, they're just as attractive and they're just as better able to help everyone and everything around them. And so um, that's what the foundation principles do. That's what conscious capitalism does. That's when everybody's thriving is when you sort of, you get that action, you know, you get that type of thing. I mean, I have, uh, I, I used to hate it when it happened, but I have employees say things like, you know, kept working at the container stores made me a, it's made me a better father. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, don't say that, it's embarrassing. I mean, and it was like really, and then they go into telling me why. Or at company functions, happens all the time, somebody stand up and say, you know, my husband is a better father and a better spouse because of the foundation principles and working at the container store. And it's like, you never get used to hearing that. And it is embarrassing, but it is true. And so I think um, business is just to remember that every single employee worldwide is somebody's precious child, you know, that's been nurtured and developed by parents. And now we have a lot of control over their lives because you spend mo most of your waking hours working. And, and people, it's probably wrong, but we put too much of our self-worth in what we do at work. You know, friends and family are more important, but our self-esteem has a great deal to do with work. So an oppressive workplace, an oppressive employer um, is really bad for the human spirit and human psyche, and uh, a good one is, is, is really, really, really good. Part of it is understanding the essence of the human spirit. People don't want to come to work and goof off and do as little as possible. They want to come to work and do great things with people they admire and love. Uh, they love to work with great people and then go home at night feeling wonderful about what they've accomplished. And um, so a good boss recognizes that and nurtures and develops that. A bad boss is someone that thinks that people don't want to do much and then they treat them that way and then you kind of reap what you sow. Uh, another important thing is that people love to work with people that are great at the container store, another foundation principle is one equals three. Uh, we only hire great people. I know Google does the same thing. Uh, how delightful it is to be able to work with people that are wonderful, that you think are wonderful. In fact, I think it's one of the most important aspects of uh, being a great place to work that you're, um, you get to work. If we started a golf team and we had Phil Mickelson on the golf team, don't you think would feel better about being on that team than if he wasn't there? It's like, wow, you know, I mean, it's really great. And, um, so that's something we really pay a lot of attention to. One equals three. One great, one great person can easily do the business productivity of three good people. 
Uh, we don't have an HR department. Our, our head of recruiting understands that it's her job to make sure the rest of us bring all of our friends and relatives in that are, that are great. Uh, we don't have any rules against family or uh, relationships. Uh, uh, Sharon and I are married, so it's mayhem. People, you know, get married, they date, they whatever. That's 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 fine. It, uh, people bring in their their relatives. I mean, you know what? Which of your cousins are great and which ones aren't? You know, and uh, so I think that's how you find great people uh, is finding people you care about. And you know, a pretty good summation of what we do to try to make everybody thrive. What I believe Google does. What conscious capitalists and companies do is the wake thing, W-A-K-E, like a boat's wake. Um, your wake and my wake, your wake is so much bigger and more powerful than you think it is. It's um, really an interesting message. Everybody wildly underestimates the power of their wake. And even the most arrogant person you know wildly underestimates the power of their wake. My, my favorite movie is probably, corny as it is, um, it's a Wonderful Life, because the whole movie shows one guy, George Bailey, the incredible power of his wake. And you know, he, he believed that his savings and loan had such an amazing impact on Bedford Falls. Um, you know, it's, uh, you're like that, we're all like that. Isn't it nice to know that um, everything you do and everything you, you do not do has such an impact on the people around you and your business? So I think that a person that's mindful of their wake behaves differently and behaves a lot better and other people find her to be more honorable, easier to love, exciting to be around. An organization where everybody is mindful of its wake is the same way. I mean, people, uh, um, that's an unassailable business advantage. Uh, people want to work for that company. They want to shop, people, you know, consumers vote with their pocketbook. You want to be a vendor to that kind. It's such an honor to be a vendor of, of, of Google or a vendor of container store. I mean, you know, that's a, uh, if you're a vendor of the container store, then everybody that wants to do storage at organization sees that, then they want your product because the container store leads that category. And um, so the power of your wake, I think wake is a really good summation of what conscious capitalism is all about. Just being mindful of the impact of, of, of what we do uh, as an organization. So it's creating a business where everyone associated with it thrives. The stakeholder model can go to, I've talked to Ed Freeman about this, and it can be your employees, childs, schools, vendors. You know, it, that ripple effect can go out, you know, so that uh, the way that you deal with that stakeholder is impacted way out there, and it's really a beautiful thought. I mean, if you think you, if, if you think of power of your wake's not just dramatically more, just think about the ripple effect of, of, of things like that. But conscious capitalism, our foundation principles, um, uh, creating a, a yummy, uh, quirky culture where everybody thrives and everybody can be themselves. People join the company and they never leave. We have, we have turnover of less than 10% in a retail industry that has a um, an average turnover of uh, over 100%, uh, even though we have one ex-employee that just joined us here that used to work for the container store and now works for Google. But we, we still love her. She's great. She's part of that single digit turnover. <laughs> but um, I love um, retail. I love the container store. We're so nuts that my wife and I are still working 70 or 80 hours a week uh, after 36 years of it. But we're doing what we love. I, I really do believe that the true artist of life blurs the distinction between work and play. You know, vendors become friends. Uh, creating, a, creating a new product is more fun than playing golf. Um, you know, you're, um, you're like Monet painting the water lilies. You're doing what you want to do. And I think that's when you can do great things and um, leave the world a better place than, than you found it and have an impact on your employees and your stakeholders' lives. And it's really fun just sharing some of these uh, thoughts with you here at Google. I'm getting ready to get a tour of your campus now, which I can't wait for. Um, and I thank you for being here. We have a few minutes for questions, if anybody has some questions. So the question is, um, how do you deal with it when you're in a business environment, in a work culture, where you believe in the concepts of 
of conscious capitalism and whatnot, but the people you're working with do not. You know, you're, they look at you like you're from a different planet because they really don't uh, believe in this stuff. First of all, that's changing. That's becoming less and less uh, uh, frequent, but it's certainly still out there. And um, I think kind of sticking to your principles in, in, in the face of all that is still important, um, sort of almost leading by example. Uh, it's, we've had a lot of influence on uh, getting all the best business schools in the country to begin teaching conscious capitalism. And I think it's important for people when they get out of their MBA program to understand that business is not a zero sum game. It's not a zero sum game and that's beginning to change. It's, it's not glacial, it's happening pretty quickly. The skepticism that I see about conscious capitalism is a small fraction of what it was even five years ago. Um, and these, these models like Google in the container store are helping to uh, you know, persuade people. It's very different, it's very difficult if you're working at a company that just, uh, just refuses to, to understand it or believe it. Um, it's easier if you're leading that company, then you can do something about it. And um, um, I would tend to say maybe that culture wasn't the right culture for you. Maybe you could find a company that behaved a little, uh, you know, a, a little more that way and you might flourish and be happier in that culture. Or you can doggedly try to, try to turn it around from within. And I think that's to leave in the world a better place than you found it. You know, you just might succeed. I've seen, I've seen that happen a few times. Um, and really working on the leadership of the business to, to change their values and attitudes is what's most important. I think uh, there's some really good stories about how store managers were always asking what their most important responsibility was, and it wasn't sales, it wasn't one equals three great people, it was managing the values and the attitudes of the people that they, uh, that they lead. And um, I think you do that to a great extent as a co-worker too. And, um, it's really fun to work with people that you admire and who are great, you know. It's, um, uh, you, you, can, you can do so much more as we were talking about earlier. So I hope that answers it a little bit. It's a tough question. And, uh, but we're succeeding in getting it taught. We're succeeding in getting countless business organizations, entrepreneurs to start out building businesses that way. When you, when you start a business, you get to kind of model the culture around your own belief system. It's a, it's a ridiculous privilege. What a, what a joy and what a responsibility and what a privilege. Um, when you manage somebody, you have this huge responsibility that, you know, to where you have a lot of impact on their, on, on their lives. And so then you can do it um, as, a, as a worker, as a co-worker, uh, you're not quite as powerful for that, but I, I like to think that you can have some influence, some growing influence. Patience is probably uh, important, but uh, I can see you doing that. <laughs> Any other questions or another question? Yep. When you started the computer store, did you have the idea of conscious capitalism as something that you studied from day one, but did you start with knowing that you wanted to start a company that had that kind of culture, or did you start with the idea, or did they kind of both come at the same time? I was always really interested in philosophy. I wanted to major in philosophy in school, and my dad said, no, you can't major in philosophy or you'll have to pay your own way. So I majored in English, which is exactly the same thing, you know. And uh, uh, the Whole Foods guy, John Mackey, did major in philosophy. And we, um, we did talk a lot about that. Um, you know, idealistic 19 or 21 year olds talking about Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and all of that, it was a blast. Uh, uh, what we do has absolutely nothing to do with religion, but I did go to uh, Jesuit High School in Dallas. And, we had a lot of young priests at the time that were extremely into existential philosophy, and they taught me a lot. And I read everything, and I kept a little file of all the greatest uh, thoughts I had ever heard of, or been taught, or read, or even thought of myself. And um, 10 years into the business, we opened a store in Houston at the corner of Post Oak and Westheimer, uh, and it was, um, we were doing three or four times what we, expected to do was mayhem. I mean, we just couldn't keep up with it. And people we were hiring weren't right. And it was, it was it, 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 the, the store scared me. It wasn't our, so I, we had a big meeting with all the staff at the store manager's house. And I was trying to figure out what to do to teach them who we were, what we stood for. See, before that, you could take somebody out to have Mexican food and a couple of margaritas and explain everything to them in one evening. And 
Now it had to be something more formalized. We were getting too big for that. And uh, I reached into that file I was describing and brought out the uh, seven foundation principles, or six, we've added one since then. And uh, the one we've added is communication is leadership. Leadership and communication are the same thing, which is a wonderful, a wonderful thought. That's what, that's what leadership is. Communication can pretty well solve anything, you know, and so leadership and communication are the same thing. And they went crazy, they loved it. I was so afraid to tell them, because these were my most personally held philosophies, and I think the, your life philosophy should be your business philosophy. See, people think that you can have a different code of conduct in business than you can personal, and that's ridiculous. That's, that's, so what you gotta do, treat all the people you do business with worse than the people, you know. Well, you have to understand, it's just business. It's like, no, I don't understand that at all. I mean, you can't, uh, you know. So um, we were very mindful of all of this from the very beginning. Um, uh, we talked about it a lot. Uh, it's just who we were and what we are, and then that's how it became formalized. And now it is so hard to believe, but people are teaching it in business schools. We have employees that say, you know, my favorite course in my MBA program was a semester we spent on the container store's business philosophies. And I'm like, what? You know, I mean, well, that's what that book is, you know. I mean, uncontainable. Um, but uncontainable how passion, commitment, and conscious capitalism built a business where everyone thrives. So. The employees of the Container Store have been wanting this book to be written for many, many years. They're proud of our business philosophies. And I was like, oh, we don't have time for that. You know, we have to create more sweater boxes. We have to get that store open in uh, Salt Lake. We're opening a new store in Salt Lake uh, Saturday. And um, that will be number 68. Uh, but uh, Casey Schilling, our uh, Vice President of Public Relations and I have been working together for 17 years and she was a huge help. The book would never happen without her. Another guy, Paul Keegan, uh, uh, helped me write it. And with, uh, so I was standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, I had two people forcing me to write it, to find the time and you know, we did it together. And um, so it's only been out about a week. Uh, the reviews have been embarrassingly fabulous. Um, you know, and I'm getting all kinds of emails and calls from people that have it's weird when you write a book, people you love and people that you admire have read your book and they know all this personal stuff about you, so you have these remarkable conversations. And uh, it's uh, a lot of fun. Yes, sir? So two questions, I mean, given the business climate, would you create a business like the Container Store again today? Yes, and I'll go into why. And the first question was, I guess I can only remember one question at a time. How do you solve how do we solve uh, capitalism's uh, public relations problem? Well, I mean, you're doing it every day at Google, uh, Southwest Airlines. Herb Kelleher is kind of a hero of mine. He's a Southwest Airlines fo uh, founder, and he told me 30 or 35 years ago, you can build a better organization, you can build a, build a better business organization on love than you can fear. And I thought, wow, who is this guy? And I mean, he's the smartest guy in Dallas. He's just awesome. And so. Uh, John Mackey, the Whole Foods guy, and I talk a lot about love in business, about co-workers having each other's backs and, and, and truly love in the workplace. I mean, and uh, no, no fear. And companies like that, I think, are um, building the case for conscious capitalism every day. And, and so I think uh, uh, we're, we're making a lot of progress on that. And that uh, pretty soon, most of the most talented capitalists will be able to perceive that companies that behave like that make a lot more money than the ones that don't, and they have more joyful stakeholders, and so it's, it's already becoming so much more prevalent um, than, it, than it was five or eight years ago when we had these weird little gatherings outside of Austin, Texas, and started talking about these strange concepts, you know, called uh, conscious capitalism, and now you have the Unilever CEO and these giant, you know, business executives uh, carrying on about the stuff, and yeah, I think we're we're definitely making progress. Now I forgot the other question. What was it? Uh, given the business. Yeah, I think we'd do it again. Um, you don't have a chance with a retail business as as mass merchant as the uh, economy is, you would think. But when you when you do it this way, when you create a business relationship with your vendor, 
that is your vendor's favorite business relationship and they want to see you win and they're, they're doing everything they can to creatively craft a synergistic relationship with you so that you do better and they do better and that's when you start having a chance you know, against all the incredible competition because most, most people aren't doing that. I don't know what happens once everybody starts doing that, then the little guy would have a hard time again, I guess. But in the meantime, uh, this is a really great way for smaller entrepreneurs to do really well so that it's not just the giant mass merchants um, uh, you know, dominating um, everything. And talent's the whole ball game. Uh, you know, um, we try so hard to hire only the very, very, very best people at whatever endeavor because life's too short not to do things with excellence. And it's so thrilling to do things with excellence. And um, then that kind of self-monitors um, if somebody's kind of floating along and not really applying themselves, you know, they're very unpopular and they, they leave after a while. So I think we could do it again. It was, it was daunting in 1978. You couldn't go start one little retail store and expect to be able to make it, much less have everything evolve how it is. And I mean, I would do that because I love retail. I think it's with all the, with all the creativity and all the people orientation, I think it's the best profession in the world. I'm getting ready to be the chairman of the National Retail Federation uh, uh, January 1st for two years. And I'm really look for, looking forward to that as the spokesperson for one in four American workers. You know, retail employs one in four of America's uh, workers. Uh, it's a, a big responsibility and something I'm really looking forward to. And uh, I just like being an entrepreneur. I couldn't wait to get out of school so I could start something. Uh, what, would, what would I do if it hadn't been the container store? Um, I always say I would probably be a fly fishing guide somewhere in Colorado, but um, I don't think so. You know, like I say, creating the world's most perfect sweater box is a lot more fun than fly fishing or playing golf. And although you need to fly fish sometimes, and I actually get some of my best ideas fly fishing. Because the only thing you're worried about is what fly that trout once. I mean, it's not an earth-shaking problem, you know. <laughs> it frees up your mind to uh, think about um, uh, a lot of things. Um, my old original partner, Garrett Boone, uh, uh, this lady who used to work with us uh, said would probably have gone into furniture, and I think he would have. Um, what's ironic is that I probably would have gone into some type of gourmet food uh, thing. I'm a big foodie. Um, I was uh, taking courses at the LBJ School of Public Affairs in Austin on grocery stores and stuff. Um, I was interested in that, and then it was kind of funny that John uh, Mackey went off and did that. But he actually met a, uh, a girl that was really big into that, and that's, that's what converted him, you know? And uh, I never did the food thing, but I'm so proud that there's grocery stores like that in America now. I mean, you know, I mean, grocery stores in Texas of that, you know, New York's always had a few. Europe's, you know, France has them, but I mean, you can get a grocery store like that in Iowa. I mean, that's quite a contribution. Plus, plus, I think it's probably increased the life expectancy of the average American by five or seven years because even someone has never set foot in the Whole Foods, uh, Whole Foods has changed what the mass merchants sell in their grocery stores to the benefit of, of, of everybody. Uh, and so that's a, that's a neat question, but I, I do like. Um, the, the entrepreneur thing, and I do try to encourage people to go off and do that. What's important is that you do it right away, as soon as you get out, out of school, as soon as you get your MBA or whatever, because once you are making, particularly if you're lucky enough to, at a young age, make something like $150,000 or $200,000 a year, and then you get married and you have two kids, you are not going to go start something. <laughs> you have to do it when you're poor, when you first get out of school or whatever, and that's when you have the best chance of doing it. I thank you all for being here. I hope you'll read the book, Uncontainable. Um, we're really uh, proud of it and delighted that it's off to a great start, you know. And uh, hope you'll go online and, and read about the foundation principles. And thank you for having me. Thanks.